Thank you for attending the OGS meeting this evening, uh, which will be done by a YouTube video and Zoom. My name is James Forrester from Lakefield, and, and I'll be uh, presenting on the Old Red House in Perth. And at the end, there will be a Q&A via Zoom. So I will begin. The road to Perth for settlers began in Brockville. In 2016, on the 200th anniversary, descendants of these pioneers who tramped through the forest paths recreated the migration. As this map illustrates, there were two routes taken in 1816 on the march north. The 2016 trek followed the spring route, except for the water segment from Portland to Perth up the Tay, which was undertaken via the old Kingston Road to Rideau Ferry. In 1816, uh, this was very early in Upper Canada's development as a British colony. At that time, Bytown or Ottawa did not exist. Kingston was a town of less than 2,000 people, and York, now Toronto, was less than 1,000 due to the destruction caused by American attacks during the war. The Perth military settlement got underway in the spring of 1816. It was the first step in building the Rideau Canal, which the Royal Engineers did not start constructing until 10 years later in 1826. Mount Tambora in Indonesia exploded in April 1815, affecting climate worldwide for the next four years. Crops failed. It snowed in summer and governments were obliged to feed their people. Not an auspicious time to start a new settlement in a remote location. Note the historic plaque that Perth's 1500 population by October of 1816 made it larger than York. Imagine Upper Canada that year. It was covered in old growth forests, so building materials for pioneer settlement were close at hand. It was sometimes referred to as the Great Tract of Woodland. In the case of the Perth military settlement, a rough trail had to be carved out of the forest to reach the new town site on Pike River, now the Tay. The retired military regiments arrived in Perth and were dispersed into the surrounding forests to clear the land and begin farming. Some of the soldiers were not inclined to become farmers and migrated elsewhere. The half-pay officers gravitated to the town where several became successful merchants. The earliest buildings were log cabins and shanties, which did not survive long, and were replaced in time with brick and stone structures for which Perth is now well known. The most prominent building was a 38 by 28 foot squared timber structure featuring military dovetail corners in the style of a blockhouse. It occupied Lot 3 on Craig Street. The building was clearly designed by British Army engineers who supervised the craftsmen of the Royal Corps of Sappers and Miners. This regiment rebuilt Fort York in 1814-15 after American assaults. U.S. General Zebulon Pike and 300 of his troops were blown up when the British lit a fuse in the powder magazine during this 1813 battle and exited via the back door. In retaliation, the Americans burned what was left of York to the ground. The British retaliated by attacking Washington and setting fire to the White House. The Corps itself was headquartered at Kingston all the original doors, windows, and fixtures for the old Red House came from this depot. It was located across Navy Bay from Royal Navy Dockyard, which is now RMC, 
As you can see in this photo, the site is still occupied by modern buildings. Also keep in mind that the stone Fort Henry was not completed until 1836. The woodworking techniques used to create the massive squared logs for the walls were well established with axes and adds being the principal tools used for shaping the material. The Perth military settlement encompassed what became the town of Perth as well as the surrounding townships. Hutchison House in Peterborough, where my wife Stephanie Ford Forrester was the curator, had a famous resident in Sanford Fleming who lived with his cousin, Dr. Hutchison, for two years after his 1845 arrival in Canada. The old Red House had a weekend guest in August of 1819, the fourth Duke of Richmond, who was commander-in-chief of the Canadas. It was his command that the house should be painted red. And I'll give you a moment to read the text from Susan Coates' wonderful book, Matter of Honour. The Duke and his entourage were on a military review of the Rideau Lakes area in advance of building the Rideau Canal. By 1819, the building was being used by Sergeant John Adamson as an inn and tavern. On the night of August 22, 1819, a banquet was held by prominent town citizens in honor of the Duke. Six days later, he died tragically on the Richmond Road, possibly from the effects of rabies. And he was buried with great ceremony in the floor of the Episcopalian Cathedral in Quebec City. I do recommend Perth historian Susan Code's book, A Matter of Honor and Other Tales of Early Perth. It has a chapter about the banquet which really brings to life the 1819 regal visit to the settlement and its aftermath. Last August, the Perth Museum mounted a display about the fourth Duke of Richmond's 1819 inspection of Perth. The curator, Catherine Jameson, arranged for a surprise guest in his grace, as embodied by Robin Derrick, who remains in character as the Duke. The old red house initially functioned as an administrative centre and officer's mess. This military grid map is centred on the four-acre parcel which was set aside for official buildings such as the church, courthouse, jail and school all erected later on Drummond Street at Craig. This watercolor of the town site by Thomas Burroughs, a member of the Sappers and Miners, depicts the center of the town in 1828. Burroughs worked on the construction of the Rideau Canal and became the first lockmaster at Kingston Mills. In this close-up view, you can clearly see the old red house. The red iron oxide wood stain applied in 1819 to the clapboards remained this color for 45 years until a fire destroyed the roof in 1865 and the building was subsequently painted white thereafter. The grandson of the innkeeper, Donald Fraser, recalled in a 1905 Courier newspaper memoir, the, quote, the fire originated in the house adjoining, which was completely destroyed. Owing to the heroic efforts of the Fountain and Union Fire Companies, the old house was saved, but badly damaged. And in the photograph, you can see the uh, members of the Fountain and Union Fire Companies. The Old Red House in 204 years was owned by four families, including John Adamson, innkeeper, the Fraser family, the McDowell family, 
and the Forrester family. Each generation in the town of Perth referred to the house by the name of the family who occupied it. So during most of the 19th century, it was referred to as the Fraser House. I've subsequently discovered that the first three families were all related by marriage. William Fraser was the treasurer of Lanark County until he died in 1870. Catherine Adamson Fraser is listed as the head of household in the 1871 census. Her eldest son, John, became the treasurer and the other sons became bank clerks. Donald Fraser and his family emigrated, or sorry, migrated to Victoria, BC, where he worked as a bookkeeper for the Times Colonist paper until his death in 1933 at age 91. His obituary notes that he was still working at the paper until two weeks before his death. And that's Donald in the left back. Here's a drawing of the mail courier passing by the front door of the old red house. Brent McLaren mentioned that announcements and orders were posted on this door in addition to the town crier's efforts. At present, it is painted red. The next section is on the old forester, or the old red house and the forester family. My great uncle Fred Forrester purchased the residence in 1923. He and his wife Muriel Butler Forrester lived there for over 40 years. During the Depression, they subdivided the house and created an apartment as a revenue source. This photograph shows the house before a second door was cut into the front wall. Forrester family has a multi-generational connection to the Perth and Rideau Lakes area. This historic building has been in my family for 97 years. I find that there's an interesting relationship between architecture and family history. There have been many tenants over the years in the house, but Joe and Nora Mahan occupied the house from 1965 to 1990. And in this black and white photograph, you see uh, Joe seated on the front step about 1970. Mahan family members gathered last year to celebrate the arrival of their ancestors who came from Ireland in 1819, which was the year that the Duke visited the house. A rather curious link has evolved between the house and three generations of the foresters. My grandfather Jim was a church and house painter by trade, and I'm certain his brother hired him to paint the house. My father inherited the house in 1965, and he continued this tradition of painting the house until 1995. It occurred to me one day that I'm now the third generation of forester to paint this house and never occupy it. Here's a photo of the house with its new coat of white paint in 2016. In 2012, we visited the new Algonquin College building just down the street from the old Red House. It was a provincial investment in the Heritage Institute, which focuses on heritage carpentry and masonry. The Institute has now celebrated its 30th anniversary. While the campus had working models of the heritage projects which the students created, it seemed that there was a need for a showcase structure which would dramatically illustrate these techniques. We are currently working with Algonquin to undertake a relocation and restoration of the old red house closer to the Perth campus. The 200th anniversary celebration provided Smith Falls craftsman Michael Herbert with the opportunity to create the scale model of the old red house in its original 1816 state before siding was applied. In the photograph, you may recognize Barry Crampton and Ron Shaw, who I believe addressed the OGS in 2016 during this anniversary. 
The model won first prize at the fair and it's now on permanent display at the Perth Museum. In 2016, I undertook a personal conservation project, a careful deconstruction as the original 200-year-old timber walls were revealed. Samples of the various layers were preserved and photographed. I call this process interior archaeology. I found that the 1816 bricks from the bake oven downstairs had been recycled into a basement divider in the 1930s when the house was subdivided by my great uncle. The apartment door was closed permanently and sided over on the outside. In previous deconstructions, of log buildings, we discovered that the pioneers used whitewash to keep their log cabins clean. So my reward was to find that the old red house did not have any whitewash. In contrast, here's a, the interior of a barracks wall at uh, Fort York, and it's covered in multiple, multiple layers of whitewash. The following year, I participated in a Guelph University Extension course in 3D architectural modeling, and the class project was the Old Red House. This lab in Zavitz Hall seemed to be an ideal space in which to examine early 19th century architecture. The class used SketchUp software, which is surprisingly easy to use, but it is a professional engineering package. As you can see, a model can be viewed from any angle and provides great flexibility. A subsequent course in augmented reality extended the 3D model's usefulness as a planning tool in that it can be used to test different locations. And the upper image is the model of the house on a fire atlas map from the 1900s, early 1900s, and the other images of the model uh, across the road from the uh, campus. In the summer of 2018, we stripped the siding from the drive shed on the property, which was originally attached to the house in its earliest years. And you can see by the bird's eye view and the 1880s photo what it looked like at that time. In the process, I uncovered the original red oxide siding from 1819, which was nailed to the inside of the shed face in, truly a 19th century time capsule. A group of professors from Carlton U Architecture School visited the site and they were impressed with these artifacts. Algonquin students came to the site last year and carefully numbered all the timbers, created a map of the structure and removed the timbers to dry storage on their campus. Here are some shots of the final frame coming down. I see the drive shed project as a pilot for the larger undertaking to restore the old red house back to its condition in 1816. The students will then have the opportunity to rebuild the timber frame on the Algonquin campus and it will likely become a blacksmith shop. Here are some good models. The upper image is the Kidd family shop in Lang Pioneer Village and below is a shop in Morriston Village near Owen Sound. My wife Stephanie and I undertook log and timber frame restoration in the 1970s and 80s, so we have some relevant hands-on experience with what it takes to restore a building in order to extend the life of the structure. From this effort, I've learned that many historic buildings are not as sound as they appear on the surface. In addition, the building will have experienced modernization, not always done in keeping with its historical style. We hope that the old Red House project is successful in guaranteeing that the building 
will be around for another 200 years. And thank you for your attention. We will now switch over to a Q&A via Zoom, and I will hand things over to our host. Thank you.